Well, I am totally serious when I say that was fun. I think you have to go into that kind of game with the mindset that it's going to be fun or else you're just going to have a miserable time. I know this this could end up being like the the comeback game where like however many like what 1.4 million people say they were there and wanted to stay and whatnot or whatnot, but their friends wanted to leave, but they knew the bills were coming back. Whatever, you know what I mean? Like, is this snow game going to end up like that? Like, oh, I was there. Like, I know that a lot of you people weren't there, might have been there, might have left early, might have seen the snow and were like, nah, screw this. Because the upper deck was pretty empty other than the first couple rows. The corners were basically empty. Maybe people moved down into the lower bowl. I don't know, but, like, I, I couldn't tell you how many people I think were there. I, but, um... It definitely wasn't full, definitely wasn't sold out, but it was a lot of fun. Like I said, if, if you go in there thinking you're going to be cold and that it's not going to be fun for you, like just, just don't go. You have to go in with the mindset that you're going to have a blast at this game. And I think Bills fans, for the most part, had a blast at the game. Obviously, that's largely you know, helped out by the fact that the Bills won the game because there were points even when, uh, you know, Basically, when it looked like the Bills were going to lose, uh, there were obviously points in that game, we'll talk about them, where it's like, just get me out of here. And it really, it's for me, it didn't really have anything to do with the weather. It just had to do with, like, we're about, to, well, maybe a little bit, but, like, we're about to let a dome team, a dome 3-9 and nine team, come in here and, and beat us, or maybe even tie us on our field. Like, this is supposed to be our advantage. Like, Teams can't prepare for this. We live here. It would be. It would just throw that that snow weather advantage out the window, basically forever, to me at least, or at least for a couple of years. If you let a dome team come in there, a dome three and nine team come in there and beat you, but they didn't. There were periods where it looked bleak, uh, you know, and, and obviously a lot of that is because Peterman got hurt and Joe Webb had to come in, and the Bills really weren't a threat throwing the football. And, you know, you saw at the end of regulation, he throws the interception, it looks like it's over. But, thankfully, Vinatieri misses the field goal from 43 after making the extra point from 43 because of the penalty on the two-point conversion, which was the same play to the opposite side, although this time on the two-point conversion, it definitely was OPI. Like, the guy blocked. Like, if, if Brissett runs, it's not a penalty. But Brissett is rolling left, and this guy is blocking so that he can't get to, I believe it was Micah Hyde or something, so he can't get to Jack Doyle, and then he just flips it to him. Like, you you can't do that. That, that is a pick. Like, it was correctly called. Like, I don't, you know, I know that the picks are supposed to be legal in the first yard or whatever, like within one yard of the line of scrimmage, but he was straight up blocking. That's not a pick, that's blocking. It's a wide receiver blocking for somebody to get open. Like, he was engaged. So I thought that was correctly called. Kudos to Vinatieri for making an extra point. Thank you for missing the field goal from 43. Uh, we got to overtime. Uh, the, I, the big topic in that is McDermott punting on 4th and 2-ish. Long 1, short 2, whatever, it's 4th and 2. From the 41, and I, I gotta, I, I, I mean, there's arguments to be made for both sides. It worked, so that means he'll probably do it again in the future if he has to. But I would have gone for it. I don't think it's the right decision to punt there, but he's the coach of the football team. You know, it's just, I don't think it, it helps your win probability by, by punting in that situation. You're obviously going to probably run the football. You've been running the football pretty well all day. Like, why punt? Like, that you're giving them the football anyway. If you don't get it, you're giving them the football on the 40-yard line, but, like, you're giving them the football anyway. So you want to pin them deep run the risk of them getting a first down or two and then tying them, which McDermott was, like, back and forth on the tie thing, like, or, well, didn't really give a straight answer. He said, I'd rather win than tie, and I'd rather tie than lose, but, like, and granted, the, the head coach of the football team isn't, like, going to tell you that he thinks they're going to lose the rest of the games, but, like, I think his fans were like, we need to win. We can't go, like, 9-6-1 and one is really not in the cards here because we have, we're staring at New England in two weeks. And... I'm glad that McDermott doesn't look at it that way, but I still think, you know, it, it's just it was just too it was too risky in my opinion, and then, you know, and then on that, like tacking on to all that, 
is that Pagano punts it back to him. So, and it gets worse. So Pagano punts back to him, and then the Bills are, they get that miracle completion from Joe Webb to Deontay Thompson. Amazing play, both sides. Single coverage, just run down the field. I mean, maybe they should have tried it more often. They would have got the yardage anyway because they got the DPI penalty, but still. Great play from Deontay Thompson. Gets the Bills in the field goal range, I guess. But, like, then Pagano starts using his timeouts on defense to save time, maybe presuming that the Bills are going to miss the field goal so that he can maybe go down the field and win the game. But, like, then why did you punt to them in the first place? Like, just, I mean, I think they were staring at, like, a fourth and nine. Maybe they would have lost or stuff like that. But, like, it's just, I, I, I don't understand, like, this, this sport rewards, well, the rules are set up to almost reward forward thinking. And a lot of times, coaches show none of it. And it's, it can be frustrating as a fan. Like, you see, like, they're just kind of, I've, I've said this before, but they're just, like, so set in their ways, like, oh, this is the way it's done. I think a lot of coaches would do this the same way, like, this because this is what Bill Parcells would have done, or this is what Vince Lombardi would have done, or something, like, just, just stop. Like, I mean, the sport changes, the sport evolves over the years, and, like, you have to evolve, too, as a coach. And it worked. It worked. I'm not criticizing. I'm really not. I'm just saying what I would have done is go for it, and I don't understand all of the thought process behind it, especially from Pagano's point of view. Because that means Pagano punted and then used timeouts on defense with the same thought that McDermott originally had, who had more time, in that he could get the ball back and would still win the game. And, and you know, maybe I'm reading too far into it because they're 3-9, and nine, now 3-10, and 10, and he's probably going to get fired. So, you know, whatever. All in all, it worked. I just am giving you my perspective on it, but it worked, so I'm going to stop it right there. I'm just saying what I would have done and what I, th you know, think basically about the league. My thing about the coaches is, like, the league is like that. That stuff happens every week. And uh, what did the, like, the Ravens have, like, fourth and one at the 40-yard line or something? Maybe the Steelers 38 or whatever it was on Sunday Night Football? And... Like, they're down 7 nothing. They ended up almost winning the game, but, like, they're down 7 nothing. They need, they, I mean, they don't need a win, but, like, you know what a loss does to your playoff hopes? It's, like, 4th and 1, just go for it. And then you saw what Alex Collins did the rest of the night. Like, it makes that look even more stupid. Anyway, speaking of the Ravens, the Ravens lost. The Bills are in the thick of it in the AFC. You know, we're, here we go. We're in December. We got three games to go. We're in it. Right now, it looks like uh, playing around with the New York Times playoff machine, the Bills have a 29% chance of making the playoffs. If they beat Miami twice and lose to New England, according to that, like just without putting any other results in, they still have a 64% chance of making it. That's like almost two-thirds. More often than not, just by beating Miami twice and losing to New England, they're in it. So... Maybe they'll get another blizzard for New England and something will happen. Why, why couldn't the blizzard happen last week? against New England and maybe change the outcome of that game a little bit. Because I think the Bills could have beat the Colts, you know, on on a straight field, honestly. Because I think they're better than the Colts. I talked about it last week. Like, I don't even really need to preview this. Like, no, and you can't even, like, the game plan almost goes out the window when it's snowing that badly because you're just handing off the whole time. Um, anyway, yeah, like, they're we're right in the middle of it. Uh, there's a couple weird scenarios that it's, I don't know, like, there's... This, the three-way tie scenarios where, like, if the Bills tie with Tennessee and San, or San Diego, Tennessee and the Chargers, who they lost to, the Bills actually would have the tiebreaker there because it's a three-way tie, strength of victory or something like that, whatever. But if they get into a three-way tie with Kansas City and Tennessee, Kansas City who they beat, the Kansas City would get it. Like, it doesn't... And it doesn't really make a ton of sense, but, like, this is what the tiebreakers come down to. So you're in a situation where, do you want the Chargers to win the division? Sort of, because you have the tiebreaker with Kansas City, but also you don't want to tie with the Titans and the Chiefs. So if the Chiefs win the division, you, okay, like, the Chiefs play the Chargers. That's why this is a big thing. You know, if the Chiefs 
win the division and the Chargers are nine and seven, fall to nine and seven or something, and then you're nine and seven, and the Titan and the Titans fall to eight and eight or something. I mean, they're they're eight and four now or eight and five now, but you know they got at San Francisco. They've won three out of four with Garoppolo. You know they've won three out of four now two in a row with Garoppolo, and then like Jacksonville and uh, I can't remember who else they play. The Rams, but those are both home games. Those last two. So I mean, what are, what's going to happen with them? There's a lot of scenarios that can play out, but all I know is that the Bills have to beat Miami. I don't. I couldn't really tell you who to root for Kansas City in Kansas City. I was going to say San Diego again. Kansas City, L.A. I can't really tell you because there's arguments to be made for both sides. I don't know how it would affect it either way, but we'll know more after this week if the Bills win and then whoever wins that game. We'll know a lot more. And then maybe Tennessee loses to San Francisco. But anyway, it's Miami this week. Miami coming off the 27-20 win on Monday Night Football against New England. Very impressed with them, honestly, on Monday Night Football. Uh, it was easily their best game of the year. I know that they've won six games, but I can't. Like, even though they won 35-9 against Denver the week before, I'm calling 27-20 home win against Tom Brady, your best win. They had 362 total yards, no turnovers for the first time since their first game of the year against the Chargers. Um, you know, now they've won two in a row. Like I said, they beat Denver before 35-9. to They're, They've gone from 4-7 and seven to 6-7, and seven, and now it sort of has playoff implications. Bills, Dolphins. I still think this favors the Bills, because here's where I am with the Dolphins. As Kenny Drake looks like, looks like a hell of a player, looks like a hell of a running back. Which is hilarious because he wouldn't have even really got a chance if they, well, they traded the Jai, so maybe Adam Gase sees that he has talent behind there. But, like, without the injury to Damian Williams, does Kenyon Drake really even play that much? And now you're finding out that, like, the guy had 180 or 190 total yards against the Patriots? That's crazy. The Dolphins are still a. Uh, oh, I wanted to put on another point of that. The Dolphins only have two rushing touchdowns all year, they actually have more touchdowns on defense, scored on defense than they do running football. They have two rushing touchdowns. They were both by Kenyon Drake. They were both over 40 yards. So, and none of them were, in, and neither of them were in the first half. So, I mean, you know what you're dealing with here. You're dealing with Jay Cutler. Uh, the, the Dolphins haven't been a good road team. They, their last, they've won two in a row at home. Their last three road games, here you go. 35-17 loss to New England. 45-21 loss to Carolina. 40 to nothing loss to Baltimore on Thursday Night Football. That was a Matt Moore game. But, I mean, they haven't been, like, their three games prior to this, Denver, New England, Tampa Bay, 11 turnovers. 11! They were 1-2. and two. They beat Denver. They still, they beat Denver, turned the ball over three times, because Denver also turned the ball over three times. So, you know, it, I, I think, I just, I think they're beatable. Here's where they are on offense. You, you know Jay Cutler, 18 touchdowns, 11 picks, and 11 games started, um, Drake is the running back, I already mentioned. Williams hasn't even practiced yet. He's got a shoulder injury. Damian Williams, I don't think he's going to come back for this game, but maybe he does. Jarvis Landry's the top receiver. He's good in finding holes in the zone. So the Bills have to be on their game there because that's that's his game, running through the middle of the field. He can He's good everywhere. He really is. He averages about 10 targets a game, so you know he's going to get the ball. Uh, there is Kenny Stills is there as well. He averages about six six targets a game or so. Six to seven. Uh, Devontae Parker hasn't uh, has been hurt a little bit here and there, but averages about six to seven targets a game. Like they throw the ball a lot. Julius Thomas, the tight end, gets about five. So, you know, the, the running backs, uh, Drake and Williams. I mean, they've had because of the you know the amount of like Ajay started seven games, Damian Williams started four games, Drake started three games. Drake has 189 yards receiving. On thirty one or on twenty three catches, Damian Williams has one hundred fifty five on twenty. So I mean, there's there's threat, there's a little bit of threat there out of the backfield, and especially with the way Drake looked last week. I mean, yeah, okay, they're a threat. On defense, same guys: Sue, Kiko Alonso, Cameron Wake leads the team with eight sacks. Rashad Jones, nice safety. You know, um, Xavier Howard, nice player. But I mean, I like I said, I'm I'm favoring the I'm favoring the Bills. Tyrod's going to be back. Um, you know, it looks it looks like he's practicing Wednesday. It looks like he's going to be good to go. It looks like Kelvin Benjamin's going to be good to go, even though he re-aggravated that knee. So I'm going to pick the Bills to win the game. I think the Bills are going to beat the I'm gonna, the Dolphins 26 to 20, eight and six. Don't pretend like you won't be excited if the Bills are eight and six, guys. I mean, if the Bills are eight and six, for only other time they've been done this during the drought, I believe, is 
you know, they're again, they're 2014 with Kyle Orton. So enjoy your weekend, guys. Above all else, go Bills.